Hello, I'm Ron Vale, and today I have the pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Christiana Nuslin Volhard and Dr. Eric Vieschhaus, who worked together as junior faculty between 1978 to 1981 and made historic discoveries about genes that are involved in controlling embryonic development, work that led to the Nobel Prize in 1995. So thank you very much for joining us today, and perhaps we can begin by describing some of the work that you did and the discoveries that you made. I started working with flies with the idea to find morphogens by mutations in their genes. At the time, people were trying to isolate factors which would alter or change embryonic development. Um, and they did that by cutting and splicing, slicing experiments, essentially. Transplantations, centrifugations all these things. And they, all these experiments had lots of artifacts. And at the time uh, in our institute, there were people who did genetics in bacteria, trying to identify genes involved in DNA replication. And I figured if one would apply the same method to development, making a mutation in a gene which is really important for embryonic development, then you should see it in the phenotype and the gene would be encoding something we are looking for. And this was an idea which somehow, I mean, Drosophila genetics had been done, but mostly on the structures of the adult fly. Only very few people looked at embryos at the time. And Eric was one of them. Yeah. And I met Eric in Walter Gehring's lab in Basel, where he was already finishing his thesis on Drosophila embryology. And I found that extremely exciting and learned a lot from him. And then we joined later. Yeah. I think you, your sense of the problem was a bit more, was actually was really directed towards morphogens. Whereas I came into the field, I think, because I had, as an embryologist, didn't have the molecular training. Even the genetics training in a certain, so I, it had genetics. I worked on flies all my life, but I, what really fascinated me was watching embryos develop and that these things happen that are reproducible and mysterious and in some way, but in some way had, by that time, we knew, had to depend on specific proteins and therefore specific genes. If genes are important for morphogens, if they're important for everything that an embryo does, then if you, not, if you set up a program where you're going to randomly mutagenize genes, knock them out, in, set up little inbred lines because flies are diploid, and then look at the consequences of thousands and thousands and thousands of mutations uh, to identify which mutations and which genes, therefore, affect processes that are discrete and understandable in the embryo. So that's what we did. We struggled to do it for several years to figure out how we could and do it. It took but, some time until we focused in on this, on yeah. this project. And, 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 and how to do it, because yeah. people had the mutagenesis. Ed Lewis had figured out how to use EMS to induce mutations. We, there was a huge, wonderful thing about flies. Was people had worked on them, so we knew how to do stuff how to do it on the scale that we thought was necessary to actually under, to get enough of the pieces of the puzzle to get a picture of what was really happening was hard. One of the mm. things we did uh, which contrasted the previous work is that we figured that the result of embryonic development would be the larva and not the fly. So we yeah. look, should look at larval structures and not at fly structures. Mm -hmm. And this is what he did in his thesis. And then yeah. we turned to developing methods how you could really see the segments in a living embryo and also in a prepared embryo and use this pattern of the cuticle, which is displaying the segmentation as landmarks for identifying mutants. He established 12,000 inbred lines, which had on average one or two mutations yeah. in them, and looked at the consequences in the embryonic pattern in the larva, I mean, in the cuticle. 
-hmm. And we discovered 120 new genes, which when mutated caused strong changes, distinctly yeah. visible changes in the pattern, which was a small fraction of the entire genome, about yeah. One, so we were lucky there. Or so, yeah, right. Because um, most of the genes, when mutated, don't cause any morphological visible alterations. The embryos just die; they look normal. But we pulled out those where it did not look normal. After that initial screen, to bring most of those loci to a point of publication, still took three or four years. To go from the, we did the screens, we published an initial paper in Nature on the small class that affected segmentation. But the broad group of 120, 130 genes that affected all aspects of embryonic development, to map, characterize, assign to complementation groups, all of that took three more years. So the two of you worked very closely together during this time, and I'm Curious, what features about you as scientists were similar that allowed you to really synergize in the type of work that you did and the discoveries that you made? We share one, one feature which is important. We are very good observers both. I think yeah. there's hardly anyone who can... Yeah, I mean, this was lovely. It was, really. it was terrible. Had, it, was, it was wonderful. No, but it we was really, this. we really matched up on, on yeah. this. And, and it's rare that you match up with other people in this special quality that you really recognize minute details. And I, I think we are equal in this respect. Yeah. And it was uh, maybe really exceptional that two people who are so good in observing uh, shared this project. And we had this discussion scope where we looked in from two sides on the same embryos and then we and, and, and one said oh, look at look at this and then yes I've seen it already you know this kind that of thing a, and we, we really and we had some <laughs> some phenotypes which were so subtle yeah. uh, that, and we both saw them yeah. and then we discussed uh, is it worth keeping is it not worth keeping yeah. we had to have these cutoff criteria well one bristle yes. too little or one hair too too curled is it enough to be significant and, you know, and we, we did agree yeah. in most cases yeah. quite and well. And there, there was, of course, a yeah. kind of a, not quite a, well, maybe yes, a competitive element in that because we were so equally matched in the ability to see phenotypes, there were phenotypes that, you know, you have this huge mound of slides and you're looking through them one, at a time, and most of the slides are garbage because you just, you know, just dead embryos from mutagenized stocks. And so the whole trick was to sort, put the slide on and look at it and recognize whether there was a quarter of the embryos that showed a discrete phenotype. And it could happen that either one of us was, despite of our observational abilities, <laughs> could have been temporarily distracted and the other would see the phenotype first. That kept us awake. Yeah, it kept, us, yeah, kept, it, no, kept it was very important. Yeah, actually, yeah, because it, yeah. It's a tough and, work. And then and it's extremely tiring. Yeah, and yeah. you look all the time. It's like yeah. when you're in a museum and you are a day yeah. in a museum, you're dead, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But when someone goes with you and says, look at this, look yeah. at this, yeah, then it's much, much easier. And, so. and you did actually develop a special relationship to those loci or mutant lines that you saw, that I saw first, and she didn't see until three seconds later on the slide. So those became really, those <laughs> became like they were mine. And, and you have, I, you also have, these will, these will stay secret. These are genes that are out in the public domain now, and so you don't necessarily want to know who are Yanni's special children and who are my special children in that respect. So, Yanni, I, I was struck by one of the quotes in your Nobel Prize biography, which said that we realized that the screening for embryonic mutants would be very rewarding, uh, and that we were the only people in the world that could do it. And I'm just curious what that meant, and if you could elaborate on that. True. No? Yeah. I, at the time, certainly. 
But that's the kind of statement you have to justify. So now's your moment. <laughs> you mean it's too arrogant in such a biography? <laughs> really no, no, it was strange. Listen, Ron, I mean, we. I remember we, when we had done this screen and we were thrilled and we thought, gee, is this exciting. And we had a poster of 48 pictures of um, these mutants on the second chromosome. And they were extremely significant, the phenotypes. And we knew that we couldn't interpret them properly, but we knew that each of them has to be explained and put into some framework before we understand how embryos are made. So it was a, it was yeah. a great achievement. We were sort of proud about it, sure. And we presented this in a Drosophila meeting where the biggies of the field were present. And they stood in front of this poster and and then they turned around and went away. They couldn't understand it. They didn't even had a, they had no they didn't even say, "Wow, oh, no, I mean some were hostile, others were completely insecure, didn't know what to say, and this was the response, yeah. And this was sort of, this is why, why we said, well, only we could have done it. I mean, if no one can understand it, I mean, then it means no one else could have done it, too. So I gather that the two of you uh, first met in Walter Gehring's lab, although you only overlapped for a short period of time. Was there something about when you first met each other that you realized you had similar interests or similar intellectual curiosities? So I went to Walter Gehring's lab uh, actually in January, uh, I think in yeah. January 1975, Five. and Eric had just finished his thesis. Yeah, and uh, the lab was full of people who came to work with Drosophila without having worked on Drosophila before. And Eric was one of the very few people in this lab who knew something about embryos. He knew something about embryos, and there was another woman, Janet Holden, who knew Drosophila genetics. And so I tried to get yeah. as much out of them as I could. Janet left after half a year later, and Eric left already a couple of months later. later. Yeah. had already started yeah. to move to Zurich, but right. I tried to, and he came back because he had a collaboration with people, and I just tried yeah. to get as much as knowledge out of him as I yeah. possibly could. Yeah. And that was a, a time for me which I was eagerly picking up whatever I could get, and it was so exciting. Yeah. I dreamt of flies. When I closed my eyes, I saw fly embryos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We used to meet and eat dinner together or, yeah. and talk about stuff. I think we talked about science, we talked about art. I was, you know, because I grew up in Alabama, I, I was like... I about inverted discs. Oh, well, yeah. I had a hard time understanding your thesis, and. So I had a hard time understanding my thesis. <laughs> in all the literature and all these things. But we had com other common interests too. I mean, music, yeah. music and drawing and, drawing and art. And so both of you then did your postdocs. And then you both got hired at pretty much the same time at the European Molecular Biology Lab. Was, there, was that just a coincidence or was there some planned synergy that brought the two of you together? I was looking for a job after two years in... Walter's lab, I had an EMBO fellowship, which ran out, and he and I didn't hit it off together too well, actually. And I wanted to leave, but I didn't have a place to go. So I applied to the, EM, to the EMBL, which was in new at the time. It was sort of the second year or so. And I didn't get a job because people said, well, maybe she can't do that alone. She has just work, started working with flies. And in case some, uh, some other fly people come to the lab, yes, maybe, but not alone. And then I first got another fellowship and went to Freiburg, spent a year in Klaus Sanders' lab, and, I mean, embryologist, insect embryologist. And then uh, I got the offer from the EMBL. And they had, in the meantime, asked Eric, you have been asked, haven't you? I was asked You haven't to, even applied. I hadn't applied. He didn't have to apply. He just was asked, would you be interested in coming to the EMBL? What a luxury. 
Yeah, it was pretty yeah, cool. As I was, I was sort say, of I was, struggling and yeah, I dreamt yeah. of being out of employment and didn't know what to do. And I wrote letters to people I didn't respect, you know, and, and begged them to give me a job. It was really tough because I had started working with flies only when I, in the age of 32. I had done a long PhD, a good, interesting PhD on bacterial genetics. No, bacterial molecular, molecular biology. biology. And then switched to flies uh, with great enthusiasm, but a rather short time. And in the lab, in, in Walter's lab, I had published a paper in contrast to all these other brilliant postdocs who took them much longer to publish something. But I, I didn't get a job for that because this was not a field which was... It was not a big field, and people were, yeah, and I didn't get it, get credit for what I had done before. So for me, it was a tough time, I must say. And then when we, when I got the job at EMBL, I was of course thrilled, and together with Eric, our great fun, yes. But they treated us in a way, ah, oh, maybe, may ah, we can take this risk. It's not so expensive. Let's take these two guys and put them in the smallest lab in a very small, you know, we had a, we had an office space together two by two meters. And so we discussed a lot. I think. <laughs> but not in this <laughs> space. <laughs> and the lab no. was really so small that uh, it was a bit hard. But we didn't bother too much and we just tried to get our microscopes yeah. working and going. And we got a technician, shared technician and a fly uh, a girl who took care of the flies, and and we had a had a had a good setup. We had no students. There was also no discussion of whether you get get a PhD student. We just were on our own, so we were a two-headed group without a body, essentially. Yeah. Essentially, for us, being in the lab, having the facilities that were available at the EMBL, not having to worry about teaching, not having to worry about money. Being in this small group where the most obvious thing for us to do was to push forward this common experiment, that was enough. I mean, there we were, mm -hmm. and we could talk. Mm -hmm. We talked with each other a lot, and yeah. that was... In, and, and then you went off and you knew other people. You It wasn't totally enough. And it wasn't that we were totally isolated, but the reason why it worked was that we were intellectually dependent on each other. So I was wondering how your experience might uh, be relevant for young people today who obviously are trying to start their own careers and they're, achieve their own independence, but also want to collaborate with one another. The good thing about, obviously the good thing about collaborations when they work is that you do have two people, that they are really good. And they, even if it's not truly yin and yang complement, complementarity, it is an overlapping synergism that's hard to predict. But I think that that's why you want to, why you are really lucky in your career if you're able to collaborate. Yeah. In, in this case, I think nine, none of us could have done this project alone. Yeah. And, uh, and it got much richer with two of us. Also the quality of the analysis, I think this is not just mm -hmm. that you, maybe we could have discovered 120 genes, but, but how you describe them and how you put them in order, I think that was, was really yeah. uh, much, much, much better uh, with us two together uh, compared to each of us singly. And I think it's the best project I've done in my life. I have to obviously say that it was the great time in my own career.